So we're going to be covering um, quite a lot of ground. We're going to be talking about diversification, but we're talking about that within a buy to let portfolio. We're going to be talking about something really important, which is how to diversify when you can't afford to. If you can only afford one property, how do you diversify? You have some kind of solution to that paradox. And then we're going to touch on diversifying between asset classes as well. There's a lot to get through. We're going to do it as quickly as we can. So let's get started by talking about diversification within a buy to let portfolio. First of all, I think, Rob, this is a good point to start. Why does diversification matter? And you can talk through some of the reasons, but for me, the top bullet point captures it pretty well. There is no such thing as the perfect property. We've said that so many times on the podcast because it's true. And the longer you're in property for, the more you realize that's the case. But you can get pretty close to a perfect portfolio by balancing out the pros and cons of different types of property. So for me, Rob, that's why diversification matters. It matters in so many ways i mean the obvious one that people talk about all the time is risk you know it de-risks you by being diversified for example you have one property and you have one void then you suddenly think oh my days i'm in trouble here because 100 percent of my portfolio is void whereas if you have different types of property then one void is just part of a wider portfolio it doesn't hurt you as much also, I say this to people who are new to property all the time, you know, it's sometimes going to take you a while to build a portfolio. Most people, nearly everyone starts with one investment. Some people are lucky and able to do multiple straight away, but most people start with one. And people have really exaggerated views of what property investments like because of that. Because they tend to think it's either absolutely fantastic, nothing ever goes wrong with property, or property is the worst thing ever. Because they have their experiences based on that one property. And the thing is, you know, it is down to look you can do all the research possible but sometimes you're going to just pick the wrong property and sometimes you're just going to have the wrong tenant and it'll feel awful but if that's just one property amongst many it won't feel so bad but let's just say you do make that bad investment and you know it has gone wrong then having one amongst many again does matter less and the more you go at it, the more you learn and the more chance you are going to hit that winner as well and pick better properties over time as well, because you will learn from the ones that haven't done as well. That's right. So we're going to talk through lots of ways that you can diversify. And we'll talk a bit about the ones that we do as well. We'll talk about loads of ways that you can. This doesn't mean that you should or you must use all these forms of diversification. The point of this is to talk about all the different ways you can diversify so you can choose the ones that, that appeal to you. So the first is an obvious one, is diversifying between areas. So rather than owning all your properties in the same town, spread them around a bit. Why would you do that? Well, one is that the upside, you're going to have more chances to hit a capital growth hotspot. But then the other is avoiding a negative. So you've got the more potential upside, but then you've also avoiding a potential downside. Because if you own all your properties in one particular location, and if that location was driven by one particular factor, such as a big local employer, and that employer closed, then well, you're going to be in a bit of trouble. So if you only have one property in the area and the rest elsewhere, that's going to be less of an issue for you. Of course, you don't really want to be investing in an area that is so reliant on one particular um, aspect to make it attractive. But the point still stands. You, it's, you get less risk by spreading them around. And the final reason to diversify between areas is you can achieve blended goals. So something else that we talk about all the time is this kind of trade-off between income, yield and capital growth. It's very unusual to get a property that is the best in terms of potential growth and the highest yielding. It just doesn't happen. So you have to make a choice at a property level, but you can blend it at a portfolio level by having properties that are your growth properties and those that are your income properties. So lots of reasons why you might want to get a bit of a geographical spread. I think it's important because a lot of people do this is that they focus on one particular area because they feel comfortable with it. They've either done a lot of research on the area and just keep going to that place or it's their local area. And quite often, it, you know, a lot of people who are new to property investment start in the local area. By staying to one place, the chances of that being the best place to invest right now are close to zero. But by doing your research, going for what you feel are places that have got better chances of uplift over the coming years, investing in that area and then moving to the next best area because that area won't stay the best forever either. It's going to move, but you can do that. You can move your portfolio around as your research takes you to different places. And that is, you know, really ma trying to maximize the upside through your diversification. But again, you don't have to. There are investors who do just invest in one location and that works for them and that's fine.
The next is diversifying between strategies. So this is, again, an obvious one. A lot of people are doing this now, having their long-term lets, but also adding holiday lets into the mix. By doing that, you've got a bit of variation there. So if you have all holiday lets and then something like, I don't know, a pandemic happens, <laughs> that could be a problem. Or if you've got all long-term lets, you're foregoing the potential benefits of having, say, high-yielding properties that have got good growth potential because they're in picturesque parts of the country. So you you can diversify between strategies to get a bit of a blend. You could also choose to choose different business models. So you could do flips for profit and then reinvest those profits in buy to let. That's something else that we see happening quite a lot. Those are two entirely different strategies. And rather than just being purely in flips, for example, where really you're only as good as your last project, there's always the possibility that you've got your money tied up in something and you won't be able to exit or you won't be able to get the valuation you want. Well, if you've been taking some of those profits and reinvesting them in buy to let then you've got a steady income stream off on the side of that so you're better diversified and then there's diversifying between hmos and buy to let so this is similar to what we were saying earlier about areas you've got your growth properties and your income properties you could do the same thing by targeting different strategies you could have your hmos for your income but you could have your buy to let properties for growth these are just some examples there are lots of different ways you can diversify between strategies this is definitely something we do do which is diversifying between different property types so you uh, could invest in houses or flats but you could do both it's something we talk about on the podcast a lot the reason why is i don't feel like we've cracked it yet the general consensus is because people seem to have really polarized views when it comes to houses versus flats now i know there'll be people here will go you know what? i'm open to both and well done to you because that's exactly how we are because in some locations going for a flat is the absolute right thing to do and in some locations going for a house is absolutely the right thing to do and having a mix of both in your portfolio if you decide to grow a bigger portfolio is absolutely the right thing to do you can also consider mixing older and newer properties if you want as well to really diversify so what do i mean by that i don't mean something that's you know brand new and 10 years old but you could have a georgian property victorian properties in your portfolio and then go for brand new stuff as well there are pros and cons to to doing that i'm not saying it's recommendation but it's another way that you can potentially diversify you could also diversify between tenant types why would you do that well because there's no perfect type of tenant and so by having a bit of diversification you're exposed to different parts of the market so for example if all you did was student properties then you could end up in a situation where there's structural decline in that market we've seen this in many city centers where there's a lot lots more uh, custom university built owned and operated accommodation coming on and so the sort of the traditional student student area are really struggling and that's something that's been happening for probably for five ten years now and that's something that will not affect you as much if that's part of your portfolio but not all of your portfolio but then you've got some types of tenant who are kind of more recession proof so tenants who are receiving universal credit their income source tends to be pretty secure so that's a good thing but then managing those types of tenant can come with specific challenges that need to be navigated as well so again you can get a bit of a mix even like within one tenant group just so like sort of working professional tenants you could even get diversification there by sort of going for different segments of the market yeah something that we both have in our portfolios is we have properties that target people who probably are on lower incomes and then properties middle of the road and then we both have what you probably call premium um, properties in our portfolios as well which are properties that are amongst their best in their locations and attract the premium rent there's advantages and disadvantages again to each type but by having each type again it's another way of diversifying now, I think it's worth saying that you are listening to this and you've only got one property. Some of these strategies aren't ready for you yet, but you should be thinking this way and not just randomly picking your properties one by one. That's a big mistake that Rob and I have made in the past. And again, I talked about this in the podcast, not thought through our strategy enough at the beginning. And we've kind of just bought some properties and then realized after a while, that we've had to pivot, but probably both pivoted in different ways too late into the next phase of our strategy. So by thinking about this now, it really set you right and set you up for more success because most people won't put the effort in that you're looking to do now. Okay, um, let's talk about the downside of diversification for a minute. So these are all the things that you can do. We've talked a bit about what we do, but 
diversification has lots of benefits that we've covered, but then there are downsides. And they're pretty obvious, but it's worth running through. So the one is that it's harder to become an expert in one particular style or location. So I've talked about people who do purely invest in one particular location. So I know someone who only rents to people on universal credit in a particular part of Milton Keynes. That's all he does. And so as a result, he is the expert in doing that. He will be able to tell you to almost to the penny what a property would be worth, how much rent he could charge. And he knows how to get the best deals because he's connected with the three agents who deal in that particular type of property in that particular area. That's a huge advantage. And you can't replicate that if you are trying to do different strategies all over the country. So there's definitely a balance to be struck because, of course, he, by having a concentrated portfolio, has risk there as well. So there's certainly a happy medium, I think, where you're not spreading yourself too thin because that ties into the second point as well. If you are doing different things all over the place, then there's just more to manage, especially if you've got different strategies, especially if they involve more hands-on strategies like holiday lets or HMOs. But even if they don't, then there's just more going on. So even just having properties in different locations means potentially you've got more agents to keep on top of. Or if you're self-managing, you don't just have one tradesman to call. You've got sort of tradespeople across the country. You need to sort of find them in six different cities or whatever it is. So there is more to manage there. And there are certainly economies of scale that come in terms of keeping everything together, which you will lose by the diversification. So it's a trade-off. The final point on this is that you are less likely to underperform, but you're also less likely to, to outperform. So by doing a bit of everything, you're going to average out a little bit. So let's say you were super duper wealthy and so you wanted to buy in every town in England. Well, if you did that, then you would probably end up kind of approximating the average UK property performance, which may be pretty good, but that means that you're not going to outperform it. So if you went all in on one particular location and you got it right, then that would be amazing. You'd outperform. But there's also the potential you get it wrong as well. Something to think about, Rob, is how much of this you do and how diversification solves a lot of problems. It's generically a good thing to do, but you can take it too far. So we'll move on to the next part now, which is how to diversify when you can't afford to. We've touched on this already, but this is a dilemma that lots of investors face. So let's say that you've saved up £50,000 and that's enough for you to buy one or maximum two properties, depending on where in the country you are. That's a huge achievement for most people, but it could then take you years to save for another. So how are you going to get that diversification? How do you avoid placing all your eggs in one basket? Well, for the most part, this is just a feature of property investing. That's how it goes. You're not going to be diversified on day one. You build up your portfolio over a long period of time. And like Rob said absolutely rightly earlier, it's something that you think about, you're aware of, you build that strategy and you build in your diversification over time. That's how it goes. Yes, it will take you some time to save up, but now you've got the rent to put towards that next property and you might get a helping hand from capital growth and be able to remortgage and things like that. If you do particularly want diversification from day one, then there's another way of investing in property, which is using property funds. So Rob, I'm going to land you with a difficult question now. What is a property fund? Well, a property fund is where a collective group of people will put their money in and that fund, that group of people, well, the fund manager, will then select properties on their behalf. So the most common one is a REIT, a real estate investment trust. So you buy shares in that REIT and you have a share of that fund and you will see funds for all different types of things as you've seen on the screen. So you will, will see residential funds, but actually most commonly they are commercial and there's all types of commercial as I'm sure you're aware of. So it can be things like offices, but it can be warehouses. It can be all sorts of things. And commercial is where the most REITs are, but there are REITs out there that specialize in the type of property that you would normally invest in if you were going to do residential investments as well. And you can do all the other things that you can see on there as well. There are funds that specialize in student properties, retirements, supermarkets, the list goes on. You can practically invest in nearly any real estate asset class you could think of. There is probably a fund out there for it. And that allows you to diversify in a couple of different ways. By investing in a fund, you are naturally diversified. So the way that funds work is you put your money in and you end up getting exposure to 
all the property assets that are within that fund. You don't get it allocated to one. You don't get to sort of the pick the ones you fancy and not the ones you don't. You get a piece of everything. So when the rental income comes in from all the properties, it all gets collected up and paid out as dividends to the investors after expenses have been deducted. And so that means that you get a piece of everything. And the same with the growth of the properties. When they grow, that positively affects the share price. And so that could be across hundreds of properties depending on the size of the fund. There's really no limit to what it could be. So that naturally gives you a form of diversification. If you invest in a fund that owns 200 properties, then, well, you're now diversified across 200 properties, which is something that you'll probably never be able to achieve on your own. But then you can also diversify between funds to get exposure to different types of property. So if you're, well, I like residential, but I think that the story around logistics and warehouses and things like that is really strong at the moment well then you can put some money into a logistics fund and a residential fund or a logistics fund plus being a buy to let investor still so you can use it to get exposure to different types of assets and pursue different strategies again in a way that you wouldn't be if you had to pay the full price for all of them but rob there are drawbacks to investing in a fund yeah so we talk about leverage a lot and some funds won't use leverage at all but if they do use leverage they'll probably use less than you're used to so often you see funds will limit their leverage amount to 50 or 60 percent and that's the top end and obviously there's outliers there's some that will go a little bit beyond that but most won't you need to check to see you know how much leverage your, your fund is using if you're a fan of leverage it might be not not at all and that might be a downside to you it requires trust the thing is when you invest in any property you need to do a lot of research and you have to trust yourself and your own decision making but when you invest in a fund you have to trust the people managing the fund now that doesn't mean i've got a nice kind face so i'll I'll invest with them of course you can research those people and believe or not in their track record and their ability to pick good investments but you do need to research whoever you're going to allocate your money with so it's not just the properties themselves but it's the people managing those properties and making the investment decisions around them fund has running costs that has to be taken into account like any property you have running costs you have purchase costs everything else but normally with most funds a management fee each year for them to manage the funds on your behalf and that can be again a range from less than one percent to a few percent it will depend on the fund and most funds it is fair to say most not all i believe but most are are boring but you feel quite distant to it and that for some people will put them off because some people just want the excitement of property investment and I understand why a lot of funds well, might not give them the buzz or the kick that they're looking for. Now, if it's all about the numbers and the money and you quite like the idea of all the diversification and, and potentially experts you know, investing on your behalf, then fantastic. But some people can't get over that last point. Well, we've attempted to solve the boring point. We're just going to do one slide on diversifying between asset classes because this has all been about property. Property in its various forms, in its various locations, in its various types residential commercial and all the rest of it but is there more to life than property i'm not sure and there are reasons why you would want to invest in things other than property so you're benefiting from tax wrappers for example commercial property you could often apply to those tax wrappers but residential normally you can't so if you want to uh, use an isa or a pension then there are some ways of doing residential investment within those but generally it's for other asset classes like stocks and shares there are also investments with higher upside crypto you're not going to get the value of your property portfolio going up 400 percent in a year but it can happen with crypto results may vary but it can happen so there are reasons why you might want to do it there and then there's also there, there are investments that are counter cyclical so property tends to do well when the economy is doing well and people are feeling confident but there are investments that have the opposite characteristics and tend to perform more strongly when people are worried and when the economy is not doing so well so thank you again for taking this course there's plenty more in property hub university so do go check out our other courses and i'll see you again soon